So here we have the hierarchy of courts, which is the one, the slide that is in front of you. Uh, Matthew, it's this slide in front, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So you see, that's a very simple one. There's the Supreme Court of India, there's the high courts, one in each state, and sometimes divided into two benches like Bombay and I think also Tamil Nadu. There's a Madurai bench, there's a Nagpur bench in Maharashtra. Then you have the district courts, which is in each district. Simple enough to understand. These are divided into the civil jurisdiction and the criminal jurisdiction. Then they also have tribunals. And they also have something else, which I'm going to go to now. If you look over here at the second slide, there's jurisdictions and specializations. Now, I'm, this is, I'm just touching on things that you will have much more uh, education on when my colleagues come in the next few days. So you see that there's specializations which are both pecuniary, which means money, money specialization. So you go to the lower courts uh, when there is an adjudication to be made about a small set of money, a little, little debt that someone may owe. Uh, but you, when, when the pecuniary jurisdiction is very high, then you can go to a higher court. And sometimes in all of this, you don't go to, to a court uh, from uh, the high court or the district court, but you can go straight to a, one of the tribunals, which is an administrative tribunal or a commercial tribunal, which will adjudicate on your issue. Then there are specializations which are to do with subject, family courts, juvenile courts, labor courts. All of these are typical jurisdictions of, uh, that are on specialist. Now, uh, on a specialist basis, they have been created. Now you'll see a little blurb over there that says human rights court. My cursor is on it, human rights courts. I put it in there though, Human rights courts really are a non-starter. And I will talk to you a little bit about that also. Then you'll see revenue courts, which, are, which I've put in red, which is not exactly the jurisdiction, it's not exactly under, I, I've put it there, it doesn't come under the judiciary as much as it comes under the executive and has to do with adjudication on matters of land revenue, etc. All of these courts are not designed in the same way in different states. So in your state, whichever your state is, you can go to the web and you will find detailed information on all of this. Then I put in the Nyaya Panchayats also. These are courts that were created. They're not formal in that sense, though they do have a certain form and structure. In some jurisdictions, there are Nyaya Panchayats. Again, these are pretty well non-starters even though they are very much close within, within the local jurisdiction and probably have, probably if they were properly constituted and properly uh, made accountable, if there was good monitoring of them, if there was a good way of choosing the people who adjudicate over there, then they may work quite well. But at the moment, my understanding is that they do not work very well and are difficult to access. And the value system that is adopted in these courts may be full of the older local biases, which don't gel with the constitutional violence, uh, values. Then you have the Lok Adalats, which do, does come under, which is um, overseen by the Chief Justice. Uh, the, the, national, the national body is overseen by the na uh, Chief Justice of India, but the local bodies are looked at and monitored and watched by the Chief Justices in every state. And uh, there's a lot about them that you will hear when I talk about the India Justice Report. And then, of course, you have the uh, tribunals, the administrative and commercial tribunals, which I have touched upon. Now, when I'm talking about all of these, if we look at it in a historical view, the intentions of creating them 
are very good. I mean, what could be better than having a juvenile court or a specialist family court or a human rights court? But the problem has been that the shortage of judges is such and the shortage of courtrooms, infrastructure, money, that we create these institutions, but then they are by nature weak. They don't have the specialization that they should have. In a, eventually, things pile up on them. And you, I haven't even begun to talk to you about the commissions, which are the Women's Commission, Children's Commission, Right to Information Commission. I forgot to put down the STSC commissions. All of these seem to provide a, an adjudication body, a remedy body, for a certain vulnerable section of the population, or in order to further the rights of some of the general population, like you have the right to information. But again, by the time a year and a half, two years, five years have gone by, the very weight and weakness combine together to create the same pathologies and problems that you have in the mainstream court system. So now I'm quite happy to pause over here and, and have people ask questions. My no questions so far, but I think we can continue. Okay, I thought I'd give myself a break. All right. Usually no questions is an indication either that nobody has understood anything and I'm talking rubbish <laughs> or I'm offline or everybody has understood everything so brilliantly that they don't need the rest of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, one All question right. has come now. Ha, thank you for rescuing me, yes. <laughs> Can fast track courts be set up to deal with specific cases like POXO Act are helpful. Indeed, if you look at the simple criminal justice code, if you look at the same criminal justice, uh, criminal procedure code, you will find uh, some little section that says day-to-day, day-to-day -day hearings. That has been so much in the breach that nobody even thinks about it. Every time you set up fast track courts, the fast track courts inevitably become slower and slower and slower because the same problems that exist that are baseline problems, if you don't tackle them, then you can keep on and on segmenting courts. You're not going to get any better result in the end of it. Everybody wants, uh, I think it is a mistake for advocates of human rights to keep on asking for sectoral justice, though we have been driven to it because the mainstream justice doesn't work. There is value in having courts for the family. There is value for having courts in for uh, juveniles. But then you must have judges, lawyers, defense attorneys, prosecution that understand that subject and all of them have to have a subculture that goes to ensure that the particularities of equity and justice that are necessary for that segment of the population, for instance, small children who are in conflict with the law. But if you don't have that, you don't have the understanding, you don't have the infrastructure, you haven't created the subculture, a fast track court will be fast track until five minutes after it is born. Okay, we can, we can proceed, Maya. All right. So I'm going to talk to you now about the India Justice Report 2019. This was created by a group of us uh, under the ages of the Tata Trust. There, there was CHRI, who you have heard of, Daksh, Common Cause, I hate saying the names because I inevitably forget one of them, uh, Center for Social Justice, um, can't remember who else, but there were six or seven of us, all of us specialists um, in, uh, there was Vidhi and yeah, 
there was Vidhi also. Each of us had our specialization in different fields, and we we thought that it would be a good idea to look at the justice system as a whole. Now, the justice system that we have been talking about five minutes ago has been all about courts, but the justice system is much more than that. So we decided we would bring together all the subsystems and then rank the states according to their capacity to deliver. I'm particularly highlighting this because the capacity to deliver was all we did. We did not, there were things we did and things we did not do. Now I'll take you what we did not do. We did not measure the outcomes. We did not estimate the quality of the service. Now many people reading the report would say, what is the use of a report like this if you haven't estimated the quality of the service? But I will explain that to you as we go along. We also didn't estimate public satisfaction, which I think is a really important thing to do. Thing to do. It's not only about the duty holder, but about the customer or the user of the system. Okay. What does he think about the system? Nobody ever asked that question. Then making judgments based on extraneous indicators. I did not do, we did not do that. So what, how did we measure? Something is, ah oh yeah, how did we measure? What did we measure and how did we measure? First of all, we decided that because we were a group of civil society organizations and that governments and policy people would immediately question if we put our own standards there, we decided to take the standards that the government itself had declared, the state government itself. So for instance, I'll give you examples. Where there were reservations for STSCs, there are reservations in law. So where it's at 30% in one state or 15% for one caste in another state, we took that as being the measure. So that was a hard law measure. Then where there has been an agreed policy, for instance, 33% for women, some of them have put it down as policy, some of them have passed executive orders, but 33% in some states, 35% in some states, then in some states, only the police, in some states, the lower judiciary, but not the upper judiciary. So whatever they said, we took those standards where we could find them in the public domain. Then there, when there was a general agreement that certain standards would be the universal standards, like for prisons, the prison, uh, the model prison bill and manual that they, some states have adopted it, others have said they will adopt it. But if there was a statement from the government to say that these are the standards we will use, we use them. In other states, in other cases, it was not possible to look at a standard because it was not set. So we looked at, we could used our common sense. For instance, I'll give you a very good example and you'll see it in the justice report when you look at the report. We saw that there's a big differential between the justice services that are available to a rural population and available to a population in a city, large city or a town. And we thought that's not right because whatever the logic of the government and the institutions of state may be, in the end, every individual, whether he's living in a kasba or a taluka or anywhere, wants the same access to justice and a, as a person living in a Bombay high rise. So we used common sense to say good or bad. Now, why is this doing this? Aha, uh -huh. okay. I did not know that this was animated, apologies. So you will see, in order to be fair to all the states, we divided the ranking up like this. Cluster one was 18 of the large and medium sized states, which were had over 10 million population. Uh, the second cluster, which doesn't seem to be here. Here we are. The second cluster 
was seven small size states which had less than 10 million population. Now, those two were ranked. We did not, though we gave all the statistics in the report, and if you are living in a small jurisdiction like Pondicherry or even a large one like Delhi, I would suggest that you look at the statistics because they tell you a strong story. But we did not rank these. And the cluster, the fourth cluster, was of four states which were uh, JNK, Nagaland, uh, Manipur, and uh, Nag JNK, Nagaland, Manipur, and one other state, uh, where the Armed Forces Special Powers Act has been there for too many years. And as such, their justice system, their police, etc., cannot be compared to other states, whether their states are big or small. So what did we measure? We took several systems of the justice system, police, prisons, judiciary, and legal aid. We, we took them and we measured within them their budgets, what was their infrastructure, what kind of human resources do they have? What is the workload that they have? We calculated those things. We looked at diversity. Now, many people who are very strict about categorization may will say, why did you look at diversity? We looked at diversity because we believe that just like having infrastructure or having the right amount of people, if you don't have diversity and representation, it negatively affects the way that you deliver justice. Last thing we did was we measured trends. Now you'll see that I have highlighted it. We measured trends for this reason. That trends, if you look at five years from 2012 to 2017, for instance, and you see that a state has remained in the same way, that the police vacancies have not been fulfilled, fulfilled that the budgets have not been improved, that the, uh, court, the court houses have not been improved. Then you can measure the intention of the state to provide its people with good and capable justice services. And again, I say to all of you who are learning about these things for the first time, please do not you treat this justice area as something that is given to you by the state. It is a service simply like a service like you would have a hospital or you would have a legal uh, uh, a fire engine, the fire services, all of these, police, judiciary, legal aid, are all services given to you. And even a prison is a way to keep the public safe, but not to make the people inside into risk takers. They don't go there to make their lives more at risk. They only go there because they are losing their freedoms. They are not losing the rest of their rights. And in our system, we call the, we are more and more calling the prisons places where you go to rehabilitate, to get, re, to get um, rehabituated, to come back into society. Whether or not that is happening, I leave for your discussions. But when this is the culture behind it, then we must look at the, we must measure these systems and these, uh, these services as services that are owed to us as by virtue of being citizens and taxpayers. So here, so who won, who lost? What was the kind of thing that happened? Now, we made, as I said, why did we do this work? Why did we use only statistics? Because we wanted to be credible. We wanted to use their own standards. And we wanted to create a competitiveness within the states. So I hope you can all see, I hope it's big enough. Um, the first state was Maharashtra. 
then Kerala, then Tamil Nadu, then Punjab. Now go right down on the 18th state and you will see Uttar Pradesh. This was among the larger states. Now look at the smaller states. There were only seven of them, Goa, Sikkim, Himachal, Mizoram, Meghalaya, Arunachal, and Tripura. Goa got the highest and Tripura the lowest. Now, these are things that you can look and, look and see in the report, or you can go to the web, etc. but I want to show you something else. Uh, I'm going to slip, skip this slide. Oh, well, no, no, I won't. Look, take a look at where the ones are. Overall, Maharashtra is one, but if you look across police, prisons, judiciary, and legal aid, you will see that in none of them, it is first. On the other hand, Kerala, is the first in prisons and in legal aid. Tamil Nadu is the first in police, but Kerala is 13, number 13 in police, which brought its whole ranking down. Now there's a story and a tale, and the tale is that statistics don't always tell you the whole story. Statistics only tell you some of the story. We know from our own experience as people who have been working in this area for a long time, that Kerala's police is genuinely giving a better service than most other polices in the country. Does it really deserve to be 13th? But it came down because of its diversity profile, which is actually reducing rather than increasing, whereas in other states it is increasing. So it brought down Kerala a whole lot. On the other on the hand, states that were, were perhaps a surprise, like Bihar, did very well on trends, which you, uh, because it, though it was very low down, it had made a big effort to improve in some of the areas. So when you are reading this report, kindly match it to other readings as well as to your experience to get the best out of it and to understand it better. More interesting is this slide, which is, look at the top state, Maharashtra. All the marking was out of 10. All the marking was was then reduced to one. So you get one point for every subsystem and for things like your infrastructure and uh, your budgets, etc. No state came up to even six. And UP, which has a population of over 200 and some million people, that is about one sixth of the country, one sixth or one seventh of the country, I'm not very good at math, was only at 3.2. And that was worse than even the smallest state, the smaller states. So UP has got a lot to answer for in terms of governance because judiciary, or rather the justice system, all the subsystems of the justice system are only a part of the whole governance structure. So nobody has even reached six. As a citizen, should you be satisfied with your government not reaching even six in such an important area which governs and colors every part of your living, your day-to-day -day living? Now, what did we find overall? I could go into the detail of every state for you, but I really don't want to do that because you are from all sorts of different uh, jurisdictions, all sorts of different professions, but almost every state falls behind on at least one pillar. You saw that. Uttar Pradesh as a state falls behind in every pillar. In police, it, this is only an example. In police, it is 18th. In prisons, 14th. In judiciary, 17th. 
and in Legal Aid 18th. So, what did what what were the main difficulties? The first difficulty that comes into everybody's eye is vacancies. Now, how did we measure these vacancies? We looked at what was the sanction strength. Whether the sanction strength was adequate enough in the first place, when had it been created? Was it created two decades ago or was it yesterday's creation? We didn't look at that. We said, this is the sanction strength. And after we looked at the sanction strength, <laughs> we found on average that there was 20 to 30% vacancies in the police, 20 to 40% in the prisons and judiciaries. And this does not tell the whole story. When you go to prisons in Uttarkhand, you find that medical staff and correctional staff are short by 72%, 63% in other cases. Subordinate courts in Bihar have got a shortage of judges of 44%. So with these kinds of shortages, you are asking me whether, uh, whether segmented courts or fast courts will do any good. You must answer that question for yourself. Just hold on for a second, please. Have you, have you got on your screens the one about women and police? Hello? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, sorry, coming back to this, we, we looked at diversity. We looked at many diversities. We looked at SDSC diversities. But here I must pause and tell you that it was very hard. We looked at a huge number of data points many, many data points, very, 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 very detailed. But in order to make a comparison across so many states and across so many subsystems and across infrastructure and budget and human resources and workload and trends, we finally squashed them all, the ones that were comparative, into about 78 data points. And one of the data points which was disappointing in that we could not find a lot of disaggregation where it comes to STs, SCs at every level. You could find in the constabulary STs and SCs, but you could not find it in the officers. Then you could not find it in the judges. Similarly, where we could find it and we thought it would make a difference to provide it to you, then we looked at some of it and some of it is there, but I'm giving you the example of women. One out of three constables are missing in terms of vacancies, all over vacancies. Only 7%, and that this is 2017 data, so this has improved now, but 2017 data, only 7% on average was the women who were in the police. Now, all across, we see that in prisons, only 10%, 7% for the police. Then the exception was in the subordinate courts, women's representation, maybe in Tamil Nadu and many other places, went up to 40% 40, 40 and over. But as soon as you come to the higher judiciary, sorry, I'll just go back. As soon as you come to the higher judiciary, you fall into single figures. So the glass ceiling is really alive and well. Whether it's judiciary or officers or anywhere in the higher ranks, you will not find that many women. In fact, few women. Now, I, this, I just wanted to show you, I know uh, if it's on your screens, you'll see it more clearly than if it was in a classroom. You remember I told you 
that all states have committed to hiring and making their police reach 33%. It will take some states like Madhya Pradesh 294 years to reach that figure at the present level of recruitment practices. You will see Maharashtra, which is, which is the top state, will take another 14 years. You will see, uh, I can, uh, you will see Manipur will take 23 years. So can you imagine what we say in our policy papers and what we put in the newspapers and what the actuality is? Kerala, first class state in terms of police will take 30 years at the present level of recruitment. Tamil Nadu will take 43, Uttar Pradesh will take 63. So when we looked at the rural urban divide, I think I've already talked to you, in every segment, the rural is not, uh, has not got the same facilities as the urban. Legal aid is rarer in rural areas. Police stations are much further apart. Judiciaries are based, uh, courts are based in the districts, etc. Districts are very large, populations are scattered around, so they don't get the same services. Now, let's look at the judiciary again. The average case pendency, if we take it right across India, without differentiating in states, is 10 years in lower courts. 10 years is from the time that the case is, is, comes into court to the time that final decision is made. If you, look at, if you look at criminal and civil cases and all the other cases, but that's not a really good way of, of doing it, but it gives you a fit, an idea of how much this takes. Daksh and Vidhi, who are specialists in this area, have got excellent reports that break down these figures by case type. Now, pendency is increasing. The time taken, the time that the cases mounting up are all more and more. So it's not as if today we have to make reforms to repair what is there already, but we have to take account of the fact that this is only increasing. So only in 10 states, one in five cases have been pending for five plus years. Only in a handful of states, cases, uh, states are the cases that come in one year cleared. Supposing, a hundred, supposing there are 1,000 cases pending, but 100 come in in one year, in the, year, the present year. And the court is clearly clearing 100 cases. So still at the end of it, there are 1,000 cases. In other courts, even that is not happening. So 1,000 cases become 500, 2,000, 2,300, and so on and so forth. Here is a chart that shows you that it's going to take Rajasthan 22 years. It's going to take Orissa 20, uh, 38 years. And which is the largest one? Mm, Bihar 39 years. I can't, see, uh, I can't see Uttar Pradesh so easily. So the prognosis is not good. Legal aid, I haven't talked a great deal about legal aid. Now, there, there is um, a regulation, there are regulations about that every, actually every cluster of four or five villages should have a small legal aid clinic or a small legal aid institution. But of course, the, uh, the, we found that there were about, the national average is 42 villages per legal aid. This figure is for Gujarat. The 37 villages is for Gujarat, but we found 
that <clears throat> 42 villages approximately has one legal aid clinic. But again, this does not, this, this, this evens out to the national average. In, in various states, a legal aid clinic is not available at all for, for maybe even 100 villages. Now, the judiciary and the police and various other, other usually all funding for the justice sector comes from the states. Some money comes from the center. Where the money comes from the center, it comes for the police under the modernization grant, it comes for the judiciary under uh, another scheme, uh, it comes for legal aid under the legal aid scheme and so on. But we found that where central government schemes are given to the states, almost all states do not are ut underutilize them 50%, 20%, 80%. Sometimes, the, the, uh, like uh, in the judiciary, nearly 5,000 crore in the time that we were looking at, almost 80% was not used. Now, there are good reasons for this. It's not that everybody's feeling lazy, but it is that there is a mismatch between the dissemination of money, the need on the ground, how it is accounted for, and many other discrepancies, which then end up with that money not being utilized in that year. That those things are being repaired, but repaired very slowly. And this kind of data really helps to point out to policymakers how this repair can be made. The other thing we found was that across India, judicial, uh, the, the spend on justice is around 0.8% of the, I, I hope I'm getting this right, of the GDP, but I will correct myself if I'm not. Whereas other, uh, and this is on the judiciary, on the police, states, on none of the areas, let me go back a bit, sorry. On none of the areas is the increase in budgets for the justice sector keeping up with the increase in other sectors like health, like education, and all of those sectors. But where there are increases, the increase in the, just, in the judiciary is lowest, and the increase that is highest or does better is on policing, usually. So what were our recommendations? Now, there are thousands of recommendations on the books which have never been cured, which some are on, in the pipeline, some are ignored. But holistically, the system has not looked at itself. Each of these systems works in its own silo. So we got seven nudges. Nudges means if we manage to get one little improvement in one area, maybe the comfort levels that the systems have with each other will stop being so comfortable and it will create a tension which will change other things in other areas. So undertake a cost-benefit analysis and fill vacancies. Ensure that representation of the underrepresented groups, underrepresented groups like OBCs, ST, SCs, women, and religious minorities is increased. By the way, we found that all data on the inclusion of religious minorities no longer exists. So it's just been taken off the books. So if you're, you're invisible, if you're a religious minority. Increase the availability of justice services in rural areas. Make sure there are more clinics, more reach, more outreach, more education. 
ensure that budgetary allocations do not reduce in real terms, but keep a pace of other allocations. Don't treat justice like a stepdaughter as if it is not an essential service. Periodic review of performance. We are saying that there must be performance reviews at all levels, internally, supervisory, as well as public satisfaction. This is most important at the district level, at the Gram Nyaya level, at the block level. Are you satisfied with the justice you are getting? This goes, relates to the next one, which is to improve transparency all the way across the justice system. You can increase, increase transparency by bringing participation through surveys, etc., as well as by presenting data, disaggregating it, and presenting it at, to all people, all the time. And then do research. Keep on doing research. Give research to outsiders, insiders, make it empirical, and make it only worthwhile if it is going to create policy change. Final thing that I wanted to say, we made this big effort and we are going to do it every 18 months or so. We hope to include things that we did not include last time, prosecutions, forensics, oversight mechanism. We produced it for all of these people, for the media, for the bureaucrats, for the policymakers, for academics, for think tanks, even for businesses. But first of all, I believe that we made it for two groups. One is the policymaker, and the other is for the civil society advocate and practitioner. That knowing all this, you will replicate it in your district. Look at this data in your district. Look at public satisfaction in your district. Get it down in short bursts and present it to policymakers at that level so that everybody knows that the people who are using the system are also watching the system. And you can go far beyond what we did and talk about quality, make the data much more clear, much more simple. But this is a good baseline and example to start from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Can I raise some questions? Yes, of course. Okay. So all most of the questions which have come till now are with regard to the vacancies. Ah. So yeah, like literally almost all of them. Okay. So uh, most of them are asking, what do you think are the reasons for such big vacancies uh, in the judiciary? And what do you think are the ways it can be addressed? Um, so my understanding, there are several factors. One factor is money. Uh, that's why we suggested the cost-benefit analysis. If you have 10 new judges who are well-trained, well-educated, and they are in the courts which receive the most uh, uh, original jurisdiction, and they can finish each of these cases, instead of taking a year on a case, they can finish it in nine months. Then what money would you be saving in terms of money, uh, in terms of uh, lawyers, court time? It's, it's a very complex uh, set of analysis that has to be made which may or may not show that when you have an, uh, many more judges, you also have speed, you also have satisfaction, you also have certainty. It also means that other people will not come to the court so easily. Just now, in commercial litigation and litigation against the government, 
and the government's own litigation, because government is one of the largest litigators, everybody is taking chance. It's called chance litigation. You just take your chance because it's, if, you're a, if you're a wicked tenant who doesn't want to get out of his landlord's house, you just pay a lawyer 1500 a month and he'll keep you in court for 10 years. So your rent has only gone up by 15, 1500 but you're going to stay in that place and keep somebody out of, it, out of their money and probably keep the, keep the house from being demolished and probably won't make space for another three families. So all of this builds up. So money is one problem. Infrastructure, the worry that if, if all of the sanction strength of the judges were put in place today, you would be short of 4,000 court halls. That's another problem. How are you going to create the infrastructure for these judges? In my view, frankly, judges should not have holidays. There should be enough judges that do rotation. No three-month holidays, two-month holidays, one-month holidays. You get holidays like all of us do, six days a week. And now if they're changing labor laws to 12 hours a day, then you should change judges to 12 hours a day and lawyers and everybody else. This really, this kind of thing makes me absolutely mad that you have this selective equality or equity for people. Sorry, that's more than the question you asked me. On policing, I don't know whether it's a good idea to have more police or to have a more educated police whose values are completely different to the present values that the police subculture has. For instance, you will have heard other people talking about the police, especially my colleague Deviani, uh, Devika, I beg your pardon, from uh, CHRI. She and I have been working together for many years and we both feel that the use of the police to which the police have been put in this lockdown area at a time when people are suffering so hugely is unconscionable. They have to treat this as assisting in people being prevented from getting harming and hurting and being hurt and treated like a public health issue rather than a law and order issue which there is what they're using for what does it make sense to any common sense person or even half wit to file an fir against a bunch of people who are agitating because they want to go home where are you going to put them you're going to put them in a stadium and then when they're all together, you're going to, you're, are you going to guarantee that they don't get a cough and a wheeze and a sickness from just the misery of being away from their loved ones? And then you put them in prison where you are seeing the statistics that are mind boggling about what is happening in the prisons? You have not prepared your basic infrastructure to deal with a situation which you should have thought of years ago. And now the payment for that is the citizenry who are paying taxes and keeping you in power. So each of these subsystems, you will have to work out what it means to fill a vacancy. It is better to fill a vacancy in the training colleges than to just keep on adding more uniformed jackboots. Thank you, Maya. Can I ask you two questions together and then maybe you can answer? Sure. sure. One is specifically with regard to the, uh, the study you have presented. Like during the study, was there any bifurcation of cost undertaken among the three levels of judiciary within a state? Uh, there might have been. There might have been. You have to look at the statistics. I think there has been, but I think that what has been produced in the document itself is a, a, a holistic uh, spend on the judiciary. Okay. But that, that data is available uh, if you go to the NJDG. 
or to the state or to the state uh, websites. But it's a good question, and I will attempt to answer it in the next 24 hours. Thank you, Maya. And another set of query, like I'm just clubbing them together, was with regard to the judicial reforms. Yeah. What has been the progress with regard to it? And are there suggestions from within the judiciary with regard to the same? There, there are lots of suggestions from within the judiciary. There are uh, by the law commission, so, uh, by uh, successive judges, chief justices, uh, and also by civil society uh, organizations like I've just spoken about, Daksh and Vidhi, and academics who, who look at this. There has been a huge amount of uh, reform and repair suggested to the judiciary. Uh, some of the repair uh, the in can be put at the door <coughs> of the judiciary itself. Other stuff can be put at the door of the executive. But basically, there is a benign or a malignant neglect of this and everything is dust coated in this tussle between executive power and judiciary power but that does not excuse the long wait for judicial reform okay now it's a it's a question with regard to uh, with uh, asking your opinion with regard to public pressure has pushed cases on fast track and resulted in quick judgments. Hmm. How do you view this? I think that fast tracks are a good thing in the present environment because at least somebody is getting some kind of relief. But, but my attitude towards it is very ambivalent. You don't get fast track, uh, fast track courts in jurisdictions that actually work. Why is Matthew not worthy of a fast track judgment and Maya Daruwala is worthy of a fast track judgment. If you're talking about equality before the law, it is equality in terms of time as well, in terms of finances as well, in terms of discrimination as well. So many powerful and I would say efficient and strong segments of the population have in fact got specialist courts, which is a good thing, and got fast track courts, which at least gives some relief in cases where the, the country or the perception, public perception is that you cannot wait long for this. But on the other hand, and this is a matter of discussion, I don't, I don't say my views are the correct ones. What happens if the state says, Whenever we, we have a case of sedition or a case under the UAPA or where we are calling you a terrorist, we will do fast track courts and we will make sure that there is a prosecutor who is very powerful and give you your answer, which will be guilty, very fast. The law is very fine. It is like the manna from heaven. It, it, it is very, very fine. It is very, very granulated. And you have to keep that quality of granularity and time and knowledge and attention to every case. And we should be building to that. Thank you, Maya. There are no more questions at the moment. Okay. Yeah, would you like to proceed or how to go about it?
I am done. I have done my duty by Henry and by 179 students, I hope. A lot of your colleagues are also here. Oh, well, poor old them because they know what I think and say. Maya, um, thanks a lot. Thanks for being uh, here to kick off the um, module two, which is going to deal uh, on courts, on legal aid, on national human rights institutions and state human rights institutions. On the last day, we will be having um, Rosalind Noonan from New Zealand, who has been the chairperson of the uh, Global, Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, fortunately, we have former senior dedicated staff of the National Human Rights Commission of India who will be speaking about what the NHRC is and should be and perhaps uh, is not today. Thank you very much. And to my participant friends, um, we, are, we are finishing early today. You will not be having uh, your, um, your review meeting if you're going to have it after 5.30. You will be immediately sent the link. And at 5.30 today will be our second anniversary of the killing and death of 16 people in Tutagorin on the 22nd of May, 2018. You spoke about institutions for justice today. You spoke about courts. You spoke about legal aid. The legal aid in Tutagorin at that time was different. And we all saw it. Maya saw it. The legal aid of Tutagorin went to the police stations and caught people who had been kept illegally in detention. This is unique. They don't do it regularly, but they did it in Tutagorin. And we are grateful to them for that. But for justice for those who were killed, those who were tortured, and many of them are today continuing to go to hospital, meet medical expenses, which are short what the government compensated them with interim ex gratia payments several times, justice has not been met. NHRC, Aruna Jagadishan, CBI inquiry, etc. And therefore, we start our meeting at 5.30. You would have got the links. You will get the links once you are out of this. You have to get out to get into that other link. We will be very, very careful. Therefore, please come only with your registration. If you don't come with your registration and you come with your Galaxy phones, etc., you will not be allowed inside. And you know why it is not. We have a number of people who will be participating on, on Zoom and it is also available on Facebook Live. Tell your friends to go to Facebook Live on People's Watches Facebook. The connections are given and you will be able to access the meeting. We will have, we hope to have a few tens of thousands of people who will follow this meeting from throughout the state to show how we condemn and to tell the district magistrate of Tutagorin who said not more than 50 people should be there to play homage. We throw Mr. Sandeep Nanduri wherever he has to be thrown. We will be 50,000 people paying homage today in the, in the style that we have to pay. And that is what we are doing. Maya was part of that jury which went to Tutukarin for three days into the little lanes and lanes and lanes of Tutukarin and the neighboring villages to know what really took place. So friends, I will close here. Tomorrow at 8.45, we will have our first session formal session of module one, where senior advocate of the Supreme Court, Mr. Sanjay Parik, will be appearing. Mr. Sanjay Parik has been spending his year, he's a, he's a very special lawyer. He still appears for Mehta Patkar. And he has 30 years of cases that he has done pro bono for Mehta Patkar all these years. Amazing personality. All always standing for the, the causes which society thinks has been lost, but he's happy that he's doing them. And we asked him once, how do you keep your sanity? And he said, I do painting. I do painting. He's an artist, Maya. He's an artist. Very surprising. Civil liberties with the People's Union for Civil Liberties for several decades now. A very good person that you will start tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you.
good evening thank you maya thank you once thank again thank you